well, I don't know if it's felt like two and a half years that we've been in Matthew, but just so you know, we've been in the back book of Matthew for two and a half years. Some of you are like, really? I thought it'd been 10 years. But we're coming to the end of the book of Matthew. And uh, one of the things that was our big heart is that you would encounter Jesus. Not just encounter Jesus, but encounter him in such a way that you were like, I want to follow him. I want to learn his ways. I want to walk in his ways. I want to then pass it on to other people. Now, before I get started today, uh, just in light of that, let me just say this to all of you out there that are veterans uh, within our congregation, just thank you so much for the way in which you've served. Really, truly do appreciate that. I know, I know a, a, a few of you, and um, I know that that definitely took a toll on life. And so just thank you so much for the, for the role that you played. Also, just wanted to acknowledge, uh, just in case you missed it, this last week we had an election. Um, it was so interesting, man. Like on Wednesday, I talked to one person, you know, and they came up to me and, and they told me, aren't you glad that the right person got into office, that everything will be okay? And then another person walked up to me and said, can you believe the wrong person got into office and now the whole world's gonna fall apart? And, 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 and I know that there's like a seriousness to that. I'm not trying to, to degrade either a win or a loss or anything like that. But us as followers of Jesus, just so you know us, is that while we do seek to be wise how we vote, we never lose sight of the fact that King Jesus is really the one who reigns and rules over all things. And so no matter what happened out there, I'm here to tell you, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we're okay. And we move forward. And if you think you're more than okay because one person got into power, you are just as okay on Monday as you are on Wednesday. God is in absolute control. And I think even in some ways that leads kind of into where we are in the book of Matthew. Right, if you remember right, last week when we, when we finished, uh, Bob, who did just, just, just such a great job, he, there was this one point in which these ladies are trying to figure out what in the world's going on, right? They all show up at the tomb. The angel kind of freaks them out a little bit. They're trying to figure out this Jesus, is he really alive? And then the angel says to them, you know, you need to go tell the other, the other apostles. They run off and who do they encounter? They encounter King Jesus. They fall down, they begin to worship him. Notice he doesn't say stop, he allows them to worship him. But then he says, go tell the boys, to meet me on that hill in Galilee. Now, I don't know what that hill is. Christian always, you know, he's, he's convinced he's been to the Lake of Galilee. There's this one spot that overlooks that's just absolutely gorgeous. He's like, of course that's where Jesus would tell him to meet him because it's gorgeous. It was a perfect moment. I don't, I don't know what that hill was, but here's the thing I love. In verse 16, they showed up. They came to the hill. Now, when they showed up, this is the thing I love. For the rest of this chapter, these guys and nobody says anything but Jesus. I think on some levels, right, they were just speechless. Have you ever been in those moments where you don't kind of know what to do? When I was a kid in, the in 1980, I remember my dad took me to McNichols Arena to watch the Denver Nuggets play the Philadelphia 76ers. And as we finished the game, I wanted to go down and get autographs. And as I go down to get an autograph, right in front of me is Dr. J, Julius Irving. Now, he is like my favorite player of all time. And all of a sudden, Dr. J started walking towards me. Now, I'm a seven, eight-year-old kid. And when he walks up, you know, you, you'd think, I know what I would say to him. But you know when someone like that walks up to you, you're just like, Show my head last. Suddenly, I had, I mean, I spoke in tongues or something, man. I was just like, I didn't know what to say because in front of me was Julius Irving. He gave me his autograph. I shook his hand. His head was so huge, especially with my little hand. But in this case, it's a little bit different. This wasn't a great basketball player. The man before them had been raised from the dead. And there they are. And in verse 17, some started to worship and some didn't know what to do. And it says they doubted. And maybe there was a little bit of mixture of everything. Like, what the world? You know, just that moment where you're like, oh, oh, what just happened? And this is what I love about it. In that moment, in verse 18, it says Jesus came to them. 
Now we see this before uh, during the transfiguration when they were trying to figure out what in the world just happened when Jesus peeled back his humanity and allowed them to see his deity. They were on, the fa- on their faces and it says Jesus came to them. I love that. This one who had just come back from the dead, he didn't now sit back and go, come to me. He came to them and he started speaking. And I think in some ways they're probably wondering what's he gonna say? What's he going to tell us? And the first words out of his mouth were, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, on some levels, we kind of have already saw it. Like way back in Matthew 11, we saw that the father had handed over authority. We, We know that. And in the same case in Matthew 28, the father had granted him this authority. And he had demonstrated that authority, hadn't he? Like all throughout the book of Matthew, one of the things that I hope you truly did see was this Jesus who when he walked up to people who couldn't see or walked up to people who couldn't speak or walked up to people who couldn't walk, he would speak and these people would just absolutely start to flourish. Those that couldn't speak could speak. Those that couldn't see could see. Those that couldn't walk, they started to walk. This Jesus wasn't normal. He had authority from the Father. He cast out demons. What must have that have been like? He walked on water, strange. He called a man back from the grave. He spoke to the wind. When he taught, they would say, man, this this man has a unique authority that's different than any other people that have been speaking to us. He's not the same. So it's not as if he hasn't had authority. In fact, in Colossians 1, we know from the very beginning, he's the one who created. And by him and through him and for him, all things exist. Nothing holds together apart from Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus has always had authority. But there's something unique here. He had come to earth, enveloped himself in flesh, truly God, truly man, And there he stood in front of them as the one who had conquered sin, the one who had conquered death, the one who had conquered Satan. Oh boy. He didn't just have authority over things that they could see or couldn't see. He now had authority even over the things to come. This new creation that had broke into the world now in which he was gonna set all things straight. Nothing would ever be the same. And in fact, I think all throughout in Daniel 7, and that's what I have up there, we've been talking about Daniel 7 over and over again. This idea of this one who is going to go, the son of man before the ancient of days, and he's looking at them, and I think the way he's speaking, he's saying to them, this one from Daniel 7, 13, I'm here. Here I am. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one you've been longing for. Here I am in front of you. And let me just tell you something. He has given me all authority like he said he would in verse 14. And I'm about ready to make this world all kinds of different. Here I am. Now, I don't think they fully got it. In Acts 1, we learn that they come up in front of him like, okay, now you're going to restore all things to Israel. And Jesus is like, oh, my plan's way bigger than Israel. But in this, here's this one who has all authority. That's why I say, if you're somebody here today that's like, you know, well, you know, the people that won the elections, the right people are in power. No, they're not. They're in positions that God has allowed them to be in. The only reason they're in those positions is not because of a get out the vote movement. They're there because the Father has allowed them to be there for a reason. If you're, no, 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 I'm not even done. On the other side of it, if you're somebody sitting there going, oh, the wrong people got into power, what are you talking about? Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth and nothing happens outside of his power and it happens for his glory and our good and nothing is going to stop him from accomplishing his mission. So church, while we do need to be faithful in these things, when these things are over, the work of the church is not over. Are you kidding me? The work of the church is only merely continuing on because you can't stop the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now you can clap. So who is this Jesus? 
Well, one of the guys there, John, sees him at this moment. But one of my favorite passages in Revelation is in Revelation 1, when John encounters King Jesus. He says this, he said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, I love this, fear not. I'm the first and the last, the living one. I do died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now for those of us that sit in this room, we can think about it on a grand, maybe national political level, but let me just say this. Because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, that means he has authority over everyone sitting in this room. You may think you have authority or you may think you have control, but just listen to me. Jesus Christ has authority over everything. Everything. And what he's calling those of us to do right now, like he was calling them, is to acknowledge is that that one, King Jesus reigns and rules over all things. So here's what I want you to do now. I want you to stand back up. We're gonna sing a song. And one of the things that I love about the song that we're gonna about ready to sing is we're gonna sing about this one to whom Revelation speaks, this one to whom Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And, and let me just say this. The first couple songs, they were okay. We can do better, right? I mean, some of you are struggling clapping. That's okay, I understand. I've got a problem with clapping, but let me just say this. Did we come here just to show up here or did we come here to worship Jesus? And so let me just say this, before we get going, the band's about ready to play. Let's sing to the one to whom all authority on heaven and on earth is to be given. We there? Okay, let's sing. All right, have a seat. I love that statement. That our God who reigns forevermore. See, the statement that Jesus was making was a royal decree. He's, he's king, right? All throughout the book of Matthew, it's a story of Messiah. The Messiah who was to come, who was to make the world as God intended it to be. We, we live in a day and age where people tell us they know how to make the world as it's intended to be, or this person knows how to make the world as it's intended to be. There's only one who can make the world as God intends it to be, and that is King Jesus. It was a decree of his authority. No one else has this power but me. I am the one who's gonna to come to the nations. I am the one who's going to go to all peoples. I am that one. And what's really fascinating about this, though, is the way that this passage ends. On one end, right, it's this grand, glorious decree. All oh, authority in heaven on earth. It's mine. It's been given to me. But I also love that last statement, behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What's he saying? Well, on one end, we, we, we kind of know. John told us, like in John like 14, 15, 16, talked about this reality of the Holy Spirit who was about to come. Jesus said he, he called him another, a helper who's gonna be just like him, who is now gonna invade the lives of his people in such a good way and make us into the people that God intends us to be and makes us able to begin to join Jesus in this announcement, this decree that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to King Jesus, whether you know it or not. This promised one, this Holy Spirit that Jesus, before he leaves in Acts 1.8, he says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power to fulfill what I've asked you to do. 
See, the means by which we accomplish this is, let's just be honest, the church can't accomplish this in our own power. We don't have that capacity. Jesus in John 15, right in that section I was telling you about, he says this statement that apart from me, you can do what? Now, we don't believe that, but it's absolutely true. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's the means by which you're going to accomplish this. But what's the end goal of the mission? What is it that God's seeking to get to? This announcement that we're making to the entire world, the King Jesus reigns, well, why? Why does he reign? What is he trying to do? What is it the end he wants to accomplish? The greatest news in the world is the means by which Jesus or the the church is going to accomplish the task is with him through his power is that the end game is not to just get to a good world, not to just get to a happy place, not to just get to this, this thing that we've all dreamed about. The end of it all is that we might be with God. Oh, that's there. Just a second, just a second, just a second. I'll let you clap in a second because Cornerstone, whenever we're not sure what to do, we just clap it out. So just hold on. Just hold on. Just stay there with me for just a second and then I'll let you clap all you want. At the very beginning of Matthew, the announcement of who Jesus is supposed to be, I love this. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. The whole intent of everything that he's doing is that we might finally be with God as God has intended from the very beginning. See, this is the point when you get to Revelation, right? Is that at the very end of it, you would wonder, okay, what is it that God is seeking to do? Create the perfect world, create this place where everybody's gonna be happy, create this place in which finally the Mets will win the World Series. You know, (laughs) if you love baseball, you'll know my heartache. I don't even know if Jesus can do that. Just, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. But I love this. Just, just, and even if you need to, just close your eyes to hear this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He could have said anything. He could have said, Well, well now we're in the happy place. Now we're in the good place. But he says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. Notice the first part of it is all about the intent of what God has been doing from the start. That humanity would realize the greatest thing that can happen to us is not just a happy place, but his being with God in the place to which he's designed us to be with him. People don't know it, but that is the longing of every human heart. Every time they see that great political leader in front of them, they think, oh, if I can just go where they're going, if I can just get what it is that they're laying out there, the world is gonna be a better place. I think there's something deep within us that knows a person can deliver this, but none of them can deliver it. Only one, King Jesus. But notice this, look at verse four. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. (laughs) Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. But don't miss this, he started with the person before he got to the place. Verse six, and he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment, the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he or she will be my son or daughter. It is the means When he said, I will be with you to the end of the age, he meant it. I'll be with you. I'll be with you in those high moments when you're celebrating and life seems great. 
I'll be with you in those moments where you wonder where I am. Have you ever had those moments? Just the where is God? David had those moments. God, where are you? How much longer? Little did he know God was right there with him. I will be with you anywhere in between that. The promise that I give you is I will be with you to accomplish this task that I've given you. This task that seems impossible, but apart from me, you're right. You can't accomplish it, but with me, you can do all things. I'm with you. I'm with you because I intend to get you to the end where you will be with me forever. See, there's something so special about that. In the midst of everything that's going on around in our world right now, we do need to remember we still have a mission and Christian's gonna speak about that in just a second, but don't miss this. This one who has all authority in heaven and on earth is accomplishing and moving all things towards this purpose that one day those of us in here that know King Jesus, that have come and bent the knee before him by faith and faith alone, those of us in this room that have done that, there is the promise that what he began, he will finish. And let me just tell you something, nothing can stop King Jesus absolutely nothing can stop him. And so if you're in here today and you're a follower of Jesus, oh, I promise you one day you will see your king. But I don't know where everybody's at. I really don't. I know that there's some here in here that have never bent the knee to King Jesus. And let me just tell you something. One day you will see him. One day you will bend the knee before him but it won't be in joy, it will be in horror. And that's why I'm saying to you, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to King Jesus. He defeated death, he defeated Satan, he defeated sin. And today is the day to bend your knee to that king so that you might know life and life like you've never known it because you know the king. And all God's people said? Amen. All right, let's stand back up. We're gonna sing again in light of that. We're gonna sing the song, uh, God with us, right? Okay, also not. Okay, now everybody, come on, stand up if you're able. Okay, shake it out. He has all authority, true? He is with us, true? Okay, so shake it out just a little bit. Come on. Let's sing to him like we believe those two realities. You with me? All right, let's sing. Amen, amen. You can take a seat. Well, if you haven't caught on yet, uh, this morning it's going to feel a little bit like when we've done those reading services throughout the book of Matthew. We're going to take time to reflect on something from God's word from the book of Matthew and then to respond Remember, every time we sing a song, we are singing to God and we're singing to each other. We need to be reminded and we need to remind each other of how good our God is, right? As we finish out the book of Matthew, again, let's look back at where Todd's taken us thus far. He showed us the bookends of this great commission that Jesus gave us. That he has all authority and that he's with us because he wants to be with us. Because the whole story has been about him being with us. We were the ones who didn't want to be with him. And yet God is relentless and gracious and kind. And he knows. I love the way that um, St. Saint, Saint Augustine said it. You have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. He knows there's nothing else that can ultimately satisfy us outside of himself. Because that's what he made us for. And so what we see in these two bookends, the overarching authority of Jesus, his desire to be with us, is both the means and the goal of this mission. His presence is what makes it possible through the Spirit, and it's what it's all about. And so because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, and because he has promised to be with us, because he wants to be with us till the end of the age, he gives us this incredible command. Look at verse 19. Here's his mission. If you believe that Jesus is king, if you believe that you have a relationship with him by his grace, this is what your life and my life, this is what our life is about. 
Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. In other words, Jesus looks at his guys and he says, this is what I've been preparing you for for the past three years. I've discipled you so that you can disciple all nations. Because if Jesus is the rightful king of all heaven and earth, that means all people on earth need to know it. And those of us who do know it and have believed it, we need to tell them. And not just tell them that Jesus is king, but say, here, here's how he taught us to live under his good rule as king. Because he wants to be with us. And not just with us, he wants to be with peoples from all nations. I love the way that Jesus himself said it in John 10 when he was talking about himself as the good shepherd. I know my sheep. They know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for my sheep. But guess what? I have other sheep that aren't yet of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus had a flock of disciples, right? But he said all along, I'm after much more than this. I have other sheep. I must get them. I must bring them. So who does he send to get them? The very sheep he's been shepherding. And what does he tell them to do to get them? Do the very thing I've done with you. Disciple them like I've discipled you. And then what we have in the rest, that's the main command. The one command he says, make disciples with a global scope of all nations. And then he gives us these three participles that tell us how. How do we do this? How do we, as disciples of Jesus, seek to make disciples of others? Well, the first thing he says is this. Go. Go to the nations to make disciples of all nations. Remember, they're in Galilee. They're on that mountain. I, might, I have a pretty good idea where I think I might have been, but I don't know. But the whole point isn't where he, where he says it from, but where he tells them to go. You can't make disciples of all nations if you all stay in Galilee. So go to the nations. Amen. Now, you may remember, actually, back before we dove into the beginning of Matthew, we took a whole summer in the summer of 2022, and we spent the entire summer just in this passage right here. And as we looked at that, especially, we took each phrase, almost each word as we went through it, and we talked about this word go, we said it could be, it could be rendered both in the sense of go to the nations, but it could also be translated this way. As you go, make disciples of all nations. As you go. You can't stay, make disciples of all nations if you stay in Galilee, but don't forget, Galilee is part of the nations too. Right? Start where you are from where you are now. There's a corresponding commission that Jesus gives, and Todd took us to it a minute ago in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In this one, they're relocated. They're, they're in Jerusalem. They go from Galilee to Jerusalem. They have one last conversation with, Je with Jesus in Jerusalem before he sends, ascends back up into heaven. And building off this idea of making disciples of all nations, this is what he says in Acts 1, 8. Here's where you start. Start in Jerusalem, where you are now. But don't forget the surrounding area. In our, in our vernacular, it would be start in Simi Valley, but don't forget Ventura County, the, the region that's surrounding it, right? Oh, and also, don't forget that region that you don't want to have to go to. Maybe it's where you came from, like LA County or something like that, and you're like, I don't want to go back there, right? In particular, he says, don't forget Samaria. This is the place there was bad blood. There was baggage. The Jews didn't think highly of the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't think any higher of the Jews. And I love that Jesus says, go there too. I have sheep there too. Go there. But then keep going from there to the ends of the earth. It's almost like that idea. If you drop a pebble in a pond and you watch the water ripple out from there, he says, from right here where I've put you, begin here. I think there's something so instructive for us as a local church in this community. This community is where we start. As we go about life within our community, our goal is to seek to help others to know and follow Jesus like we are doing that. And even if the Lord takes you someplace else or a job transfer or going off to college or something like that takes you to another place, well, as you go, wherever you go, make disciples. That's our purpose. We wanna continue even as a church to keep raising up more people to intentionally go other places where the church maybe hasn't been established or it needs to be strengthened, where disciples need to be made because Jesus, who is with us, wants to gather a people from every tribe and people and language and nation. Amen? 
So that's where he starts. Make disciples by going. And as you go, wherever you go, make disciples. Look at the second one. Next thing to do, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In other words, as people, as Jesus said, They'll listen. They'll hear my voice and listen. They'll believe this message. So as people come to understand and believe the good news that Jesus has all authority and that he wants to be with us, well, I would say then baptism is that corresponding, it's a response. It's a way of saying, Jesus, if you want to be with me, I want to be with you. I want to be identified with you. And not just with you, he says, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the way that we Declare our allegiance to Jesus as king. Even the visual that we often do of, of immersing someone in water and bring them up, it visualizes this idea that I'm leaving that old life behind. I am dying to my old identity, my old guilt, even my old successes and things that I built my reputation on. Like, Jesus, like Paul says in the book of Galatians, I died I was crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I'm identified with him through his death and his resurrection. It's this action that identifies us as part of that flock that Jesus said he wanted to gather. He's that one shepherd. So I would say this to you. If you are a follower of Jesus and you have not yet taken that step of identifying yourself with Jesus through baptism, you need to. We would love to talk with you about that even after the service. I would say it's a key step and even one of the first steps in the life of a disciple. So first, Go, and as you go. Second, baptizing. Look at the third one that he gives us here. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Not just teaching what Jesus commanded, but he says teaching them to observe. Now, back again in that summer of 22 in, in August, I get a whole sermon just on that phrase right there. Talking about what does it mean to teach to observe and because alliteration makes things stick in my head, I, it's, I remember there was, there's three things I said about it. What, what does it mean to observe what Jesus said? The first one was this, pay attention to what he said, right? That kind of makes sense to observe, pay attention, know, study, be aware of what Jesus said, his actions, his example. That's why Matthew has given us this gospel. Here's what I saw in Jesus' words and actions and example. Pay attention to it. The second one was, Practice it. Don't just pay attention to what he said and what he commanded. Put it into practice. That's what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right? He said, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise person who built their house on the rock. The foolish person heard. They paid attention and stopped there. Teach people to pay attention to what Jesus has commanded, but even more that, put it into practice. Pay attention, practice, and the last one, pass on. Pass it on to others as well. Because that's what we see in Jesus. If there's one thing that we see amongst the amazing miracles and grace and kindness and compassion that Jesus demonstrated is this. He was a disciple maker. And so if we are to follow in his example, that means it's not just enough to know what he said or to even seek to do it because one of the main things he said to do is make disciples like I've done with you. Pay attention, practice, pass on. That's why throughout our time in the book of Matthew, we've kept coming back to this idea that being a disciple and making disciples are inseparably connected to each other. They have to go together. If you say, hey, I'd rather, like, I was talking with somebody recently. Um, they're just taking first steps of wanting to be a follower of Jesus. They're like, how do I do this? It was a beautiful moment. I, I've never had somebody say that. I'm sitting at lunch with a guy, and he says to me, okay, I want to follow Jesus, but it's not like he's walking by on the sidewalk right now, because if he was, I'd pick up everything and go with him right then. How do I follow Jesus here today? I was like, oh my gosh, what an amazing question to be asked over a Campos burrito, which is also amazing, by the way. <laughs> and I said this, I said, well, man, what we'd have is we have these accounts of Jesus' life. We can see the way that he walked with his disciples and try to align our lives as closely as we can with what we see in the example of Jesus. And I said, but here's one thing that we see for sure there. Jesus never did independent study discipleship. There was no solo, you and me. Shepherds don't lead flocks of one, right? 
We follow Jesus together with others. We learn to follow Jesus as we help others to follow Jesus. That's what we are about together. Do you believe that? Have you committed to that in your own life? If you have trusted in Jesus, if you are one of those ones that talked about, talked about where you have bowed the knee to him as the king of all of heaven and earth, have you embraced then that responsibility, that joyful duty to say, Jesus, I wanna be one of your disciples and I wanna help others to do that as well. If so, then I would say this, in addition to baptism, there's one more really important symbolic act that Jesus gave us as his disciples and commanded us to do. Baptism, again, is that, that one-time act that symbolizes a person's inclusion and identity with Jesus and his people. But on the other hand, the Lord's Supper, or what we call communion, I would say logically it kind of follows after baptism. If baptism marks someone's inclusion with God's people, the Lord's Supper is that thing that we do not just one time, but repeatedly and regularly together. It's a way that we remember and, and reaffirm our identity in Christ, our identity with each other, our commitment to join him in his mission even. As we conclude our journey through the book of Matthew, and again, even in light of the way that Matthew concludes with this great commission, we thought it would be really important to celebrate communion, celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, together this morning. So in a moment, not quite yet, the band's going to lead us in another song. And as they do that, the ushers will come forward and they'll pass out the elements so that we can take communion together. But before they do that, I just want to address two quick things as we prepare ourselves to take communion together. First one is this. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus... If you're interested in learning more about it, or even maybe you just begrudgingly came here with someone else. So glad you're here, first off. So glad you're here. But I would just say, as we share this simple meal, the bread and the cup, please don't share it with us because it doesn't represent the reality of your life. At least not yet. My hope, my desire is that even today would be the day that you bow your knee to Jesus. And again, if you would like to talk with someone about what it means to commit your life to Jesus, there's some of us would love to talk with you up at the prayer room after the service. But for now, as we celebrate this simple but sacred meal, please, please hold off out of respect for that. Second, I would say this. If you are a follower of Jesus, but you know, like if you're honest, if you shoot straight with yourself right now, you know that there is like a pattern of sin in your life that you both have not broken and don't desire to break that you actively keep hidden, you're not willing to face yet. First off, I'd say don't stay there. But at the same time, I would encourage you in the same way, hold off from taking this, this meal with us. Or even if you know that there is conflict with another brother or sister, with your spouse, maybe you argued on the drive to church here this morning, you haven't had a chance to reconcile that yet also. I would say either hold off on sharing the supper with us or take time as we sing this next song. Go seek that person out and seek forgiveness. Seek to reconcile so that you can. Here's why I think that's so important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one of the things that Paul says to us, he says, for anyone to eat the bread or drink the cup in an unworthy manner without first examining themselves, confessing sins, seeking restoration with someone else, to not do that and then just go forward with this meal, Paul says is actually to eat and drink judgment on yourself. Not only that, it, it's to expose your church family to the risk of that as well. Like we have a responsibility for each other, even in the way that we approach this meal. It's a simple, sacred meal, and it is not something to be handled flippantly. So please take some time. Let's prepare ourselves to share this simple meal together. And again, through this next song even. Let's remember, let's remind each other through the words of this song that we as a church family do not exist for our own selves or for our own comfort. We exist for the sake of our King and for the sake of the world to which he has sent us and which he loves so much, amen? Okay, again, if you're able, let's stand and let's sing together before we take communion. Ushers, please come forward and pass out the elements. Amen. Amen. All right. You can take a seat again. Getting your workout in today. Good job, guys. Again, as we took, as we sang that song together, I hope you were able to take a few minutes just to pray, prepare yourself to share in the Lord's Supper. Again, not just by looking inwardly, but also that sense of like looking outwardly. 
remembering that idea. We, we don't exist as a church for our own sake. But for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the world that Jesus is drawing to himself. This is a simple sacred meal. It's loaded with significance. But again, even as we talk about our responsibilities, we come to this meal. Remember this. Not a single person in here earned our place at this table. Right? Remember this. Back a couple chapters earlier, Matthew 26, as he is laying out this meal the first time for his disciples. He said the bread, the bread represented his body. The cup represented his blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This meal is meant to remind us and humble us yet again that we were so lost, so trapped in our sins, so set on our own way that it took nothing less than the eternal son of the father taking on flesh, the one who is very God, very God of very God, the one by whom and for whom all things exist, became human, came to be with us. And then in that flesh, to give up his life for us, to lay down that body for us. Because his goal wasn't just to be with us in that body, but through that body to make a way for us to be with him forever. We, all of us, come to this table by grace, amen? Let's take the bread in remembrance of Jesus' body, which is for us. When we look to the cup, again, notice, again, Jesus says it represents his blood, but he says something else that's really specific. He said it represents his blood of the covenant. That word covenant is an incredibly rich word in the Bible, but it's one that we don't often use in our day-to-day language, do we? It's worth stopping and thinking about for a second. If you're part of one of our discipleship communities, you know we talk a lot about this word covenant. Or if you've read through our membership booklet, we talk a lot about it in there as well. Because it's such a rich idea to understand. We use like a three-part definition when we talk about covenants. And this is important to keep in mind. We say that a covenant is a formalized relationship based on promises of ongoing faithfulness in pursuit of a common mission. A formalized relationship. What Jesus does with his disciples, even through the formality of this simple meal, he's saying the relationship that we have with each other, it's not just an assumed thing. It's not just that, yeah, we kind of hang out together. We kind of like it. We'll see how it goes. There's understanding. There's commitment. There's a looking each other in the eye. Even a, a, a willingness to formalize that relationship through a symbolic meal like this. And that commitment, that understanding is important because the whole point of a covenant isn't just to be in a relationship. And it's not even just about defining how we feel about each other today. A covenant is about who we promise to be for each other into the future. And so Jesus says to us, I am with you always. I promise to be there, to be faithful to you. And I call you to be faithful to me in return. A formalized relationship based on promises, not just about how I feel about you today, but who I promise to be for you into the future. That's what this meal is about. Because also the point of a covenant isn't just to be in a relationship, it's to accomplish something together through that relationship. The idea of a common mission. We're working toward a common goal together. That's why we're together. And here in the Great Commission, this is exactly what Jesus lays out for us. The mission that he has called us into relationship with him for. He has all authority and he wants to be with us, but he has other sheep who are not yet of this sheepfold and he wants to be with them too. And so he has sent us as his covenant partners to go get them. Not just tell them that he's king. Show them through our lives Here's what it means to follow him as king, to make disciples by going and baptizing and teaching how to pay attention and practice and pass on all that Jesus has commanded. One day, Jesus will return. Amen? One day, Jesus will return. There will be one flock with one shepherd. That flock will be made up of people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation but we will be one. 
That's another one of the words that we use when we talk about this meal. We call it the Lord's Supper. We also call it communion. You hear that word union in there. It represents our unity with God and therefore our unity with each other. In the new year, we'll dive into a new book of the Bible. We're going to take some time in an Advent series over the next couple of weeks. But in the new year, we're going to dive into the book of Ephesians. And when we get into that book of Ephesians, we're going to see a ton about what it means that God has created unity between us and him that is meant to pour out into unity amongst each other. But this simple meal is a way we practice and remember that and remind ourselves of that. At the same time, Jesus said, hey, a day will come when we'll do this again together. I'll drink this new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so we take this meal today as a way to reaffirm our allegiance to Jesus, our desire to be faithful to him in the mission that he's given us, our understanding that it's only possible because he's with us, but the whole point of it is because he wants to be with us, amen? So we have unity with our Father, with each other. We have responsibility. We come by grace. But let's be disciples who make disciples, amen? Let's take the cup together. Father in heaven, thank you for these last two and a half years getting to just walk through the book of Matthew together, see the example of your son, Jesus. We may be done with this gospel, but our journey of learning to be apprentices of Jesus has only continues. It only continues. Lord, would you burn in our hearts that desire to follow you as our humble king. Remind us your kingdom is here and it is coming. Would you teach us to serve like you did? that we might accurately represent you to those around us. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.